We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 6 this morning. Hebrews chapter 6. And we're going to read uh, from verse 13 on down to the end of the chapter. So, excuse me. Hebrews chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he, had, he obtained the promise. For men verily swear by the greater, an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it, by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hope upon the hope or to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor to the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made in high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I want you to notice back in verse 19 the term anchor of the soul. We have an anchor of the soul. What does an anchor do? All right, I know we live in the middle of the Midwest so we don't anchor a whole lot of things, right? But an anchor keeps a ship from drifting into something that will destroy or damage it. That is the purpose of an anchor, to prevent drift and to prevent a drift that would cause damage or destruction. What or when does a ship really need to be firmly anchored? Well, there are several situations, right? In the calm harbor, it should be anchored because some current might catch it and, and carry it along till it's beached on the shore or wrecked on the rocks. But really, we think of an anchor perhaps mostly involved in, in the time of storm. We need an anchor when the, a severe storm may drive the ship into the rocks and sink it. And, and uh, in the storm, the ship must be secured by the anchor to prevent it from drifting. In this passage of Scripture that we just read, although it mentions, mentions an anchor, uh, it is not talking just about anchoring a ship during a storm. It is talking about anchoring your soul during your life, during a crisis during a storm of life or even during a calm time of life when certain currents might might drive you and drift you into the rocks does your soul have an anchor and if so what is it if your soul has an anchor what is the anchor that keeps you from drifting what is a storm in life well a storm i just mentioned a storm refers to a crisis in life. When we read about storms in the Bible many times, it will refer at least metaphorically to that. We could be in several, several storms or of crisis could, uh, could uh, overtake it in your life. A crisis of doubt. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the church in Corinth had, had encountered false teachers. They began to doubt whether or not the resurrection of Christ was actually true. And Paul wrote that uh, famous passage of scripture that said, If Christ be not risen, we are of most men, mo most, we are of all men most miserable, right? We are yet in our sins, Christ is dead in vain, our faith is in vain. And he goes on and proves that Christ rose from the dead because they were in a crisis of doubt. There could be a crisis of difficulty. And we, we uh, encounter those often in life. A crisis of doctrine in Ephesians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul writes to the church of Ephesus and he tells them to go on to maturity. By the way, that's kind of the theme of this passage. It says, so you will not be driven and tossed to and fro by every, by every wave, wave of, and wind of, of doctrine and of, of false teaching. There's a crisis of doctrine. There's a crisis of defeat. The Apostle Peter told Jesus that he would never deny him. He would even go to death for him. And yet that same night, Jesus or Peter denied with an oath. Jesus said, I never knew him. And later on, Jesus restored Peter to ministry. But he went through a, a crisis of defeat. Have you ever been in a crisis of defeat? <laughs> Where he said, oh man, I, 
I blew it. I can't believe, fill in the blank, right? You ever been in a crisis of doctrine where you've been fooled into thinking some false teaching? Or a crisis of difficulty where you could not see the light at the end of the tunnel and when you did see the light, it was a train and it was coming in your direction, right? A crisis of difficulty or a crisis of doubt where you might maybe at the end of it cried out as the father of a young lady in the gospels and said lord i believe help thou my unbelief and that was the only thing you could do in the crisis of doubt the question is not will storms come into my life the question is when will the storms that are coming arrive when you have a crisis a storm in life do you have an anchor for your soul what is that anchor what keeps you from drifting into, into destruction, into sin, into despair, into doubt? That was the main concern for the writer of Hebrews when he sent this letter to the Jewish believers in the early church. The, the, they were in, a, in the midst of a storm. They were having a crisis of difficulty and doubt. The difficulty was that they were being persecuted for their faith. They were suffering for believing in Jesus. The the, that persecution caused them to be entered into the trial, the storm of, of doubt. If Jesus is Messiah and God all-powerful, if he loves us, why is this happening? How come he can't stop it? And they were in this difficult storm of doubt. And the solution that would keep them from drifting, by the way, some of them had drifted away. But the believers, uh, the solution that would keep them from drifting in the storm was an anchor to the soul. Some people, when overtaken by a storm of life, are trusting in the wrong anchor. They have an anchor. They throw it overboard. It reaches the bottom. But then when the strong winds come, that anchor drags. You ever had a, you know, some of you guys that have a fishing boat or something, you ever thrown an anchor over and there's a strong current and it moves anyway? All right. Uh, you know, uh, my grandpa's boat had this anchor and it just, it, it looked like a little, a little bell or something, you know, it didn't have those big hooks, it just had this little rounded thing, you throw that thing over, that thing wasn't going to hold us. I don't even know what it was there for, just to make you feel good, I guess. And, uh, and uh, so some people are trusting in false anchors, the false anchor of politics, as if some politician is going to rescue our country. It's not going to happen. Um, the, you, may, you may vote for the best person in the world, but when they get to the Capitol building, something is going to take over them. I don't know what it is, but it will get them, and they will change. Don't trust in, go vote, <laughs> but don't, don't trust in politics. Don't make that your anchor. Some people trust in the anchor of self-esteem. I'm going through a storm if I only feel better about myself. I'll go through the storm in a better condition. No, no, you'll sink. Some people put all their trust in the false anchor of religion. And if I can just, if I can just be as faithful to religion as possible, be as moral as possible, but they do it apart from Christ and they sink. Some people have the false anchor of apathy. If I just don't care, I'll just quit caring. And that will get me through the storm unscarred. Some people put their trust in the false, uh, false anchor of pleasure and sin, and they, they dedicate their life to that. Some to money, some to career, some to education, and they trust these false anchors, and they drift anyway, and it leads to destruction. Such anchors do not secure our souls. They do not hold, and when we trust in them, we do so to our own peril, and we're adrift in the storm. When you encounter a storm in life, a crisis, do you have an anchor for your soul? What is that anchor? And we need an anchor for our soul when everything's going well. And we need an anchor for our soul in great times of difficulties and trials. Let me tell you uh, about the anchor that, that you must have for your soul. Let's, let's talk about it, all right? Hope in Christ anchors your soul in every storm. Hope in Christ is the anchor. I know uh, Christ really is the anchor. He holds us secure, but, but it is our hope in Him 
that keeps us moored, that keeps us from drifting away in a time of crisis. Every crisis in your life has the potential to make you drift, to make you act in in a way that is unfaithful to the Lord and dishonoring to Him and destructive to you. The anchor that holds your soul firm is nothing other than hope in Christ. The hope is that anchor. Now, what is hope? What is hope? Well, let me tell you what hope is not. Um, by way of illustration, right? In the Canadian wilderness, a scientific organization began to offer a reward of $5,000 every, for every wolf that was captured alive and turned into them. And so, this offer turned two brothers, Sam and Jed, into fortune hunters. They scoured every mountain and every forest of the Canadian wilderness, backpacking, trekking through the wilderness, searching for and capturing wolves and turning them in day and night. They were looking for their valuable prey. And one night, after a long trek through the wilderness, they were so, they were so tired that they fell asleep without lighting the campfire. And they're exhausted and dreaming of their potential fortune. And then suddenly Sam awoke to see that they were surrounded by 50 wolves, glowing, flaming red eyes and bared teeth. And so he nudged his brother and said, Jed, Wake up! We're rich! <laughs> you know what hope is not? Hope is not unfounded confidence in blind faith, all right? Sam had a little bit of a perception problem, all right? Hope is not arrogant positivity because, because I'm the center of my universe, everything's going to go well for me. That's not hope. That's... That's lunacy, right? Let me tell you what hope is not. My family has um, begun a bracket challenge. We began when the NCAA tournament started. I had to explain to some of my family what a bracket was and what the NCAA tournament was. I am a veteran of many bracket challenges. And so when I filled out my bracket, I was filled with hope that I would easily win. Now, there are five people in our family. Currently, I sit in fourth place with all of my teams eliminated. I had to tell them how, what teams were what and how to pronounce the names of them. All but one are beating the tar out of me. <laughs> hope is not simply a belief that we are so good or so important that things will work out in the end. That's not hope. What is hope? Hope is strong confidence in a sure thing. That's what Christian hope is. It is not wishing on a star. Hope is strong confidence in a sure thing. The one who hopes in Christ will never be disappointed because his hope is founded on a sure thing, a guaranteed outcome. Christ has sets him free from sin, from death, from hell and the grave. Sets us free from the penalty of sin and from the future presence of sin and even in this life from the very power of sin. Hope never disappoints the Christian who trusts in Christ. Romans chapter 5 and verses 3 through 6 describes the Christian hope as strong confidence in a sure thing. It says, and not only so, but we glory or we boast in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And listen to this. And hope maketh not ashamed. That's an old English way of saying hope never disappoints you. Hope does not disappoint the one who puts their hope in Christ. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given to us. For when? We were yet without strength in due time. Christ died for the ungodly. And so we hope not in our godliness, but in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And we'll never be ashamed of that hope. Hope in Christ never disappoints. It is strong confidence in a sure thing. In our text, Hebrews 6 and verse 18, the Bible says that by two immutable things in which it was impossible 
for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to, to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that which is within the veil, whether the forerunner is entered even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. How does Christian hope anchor our souls? How does that work? Uh, I, I want to explain this by, by showing uh, three, demonstrating three facts about Christian hope. How does it anchor our souls? Well, that depends on how we answer this question. Uh, I want to explain what hope in Christ is and what it does and who can have it. All right? What Christian hope is, what it does, and who can have it. Um, what the anchor is, what it does, and who it is anchoring. So let's consider the first. What is hope in Christ? What hope in Christ is? Hope is strong confidence in the sure thing of Jesus Christ as an anchor. Hope possesses certain qualities. This anchor is always secure. I want you to look at um, the descriptor here given in verse 19, which hope we have as an anchor to the soul. And look at what it says, these adjectives about hope, about this anchor. It is both sure and steadfast. It's, the anchor is always secure. It doesn't slip. Once it, once it lands in the soil, it does not slip and let go. And then I want you to notice also where the anchor is grounded. It's one thing to have an anchor that is secure and well built and constructed and won't slip. But if you throw that anchor onto just smooth rock, it's not going to hold anything. Look where the anchor is grounded in verse 19 again. It says, and it, it, which entereth into that within the veil. What is the veil? Well, in the Old Testament, to which these Jewish believers would be very familiar, there was a veil over the Holy of Holies separating God's presence in the Ark of the Covenant in the mercy seat separated that from the rest of the tabernacle. And nobody could enter into that Holy of Holies except for the high priest once every year. He would come with a sacrifice. Well, here it says, our anchor, the ground that it is secured in is actually the very presence of God. It is cast into the holy of holies, secured there in God's very presence. Jesus could enter because he's our high priest. Hope in Christ is based on our, it is grounded on a, with a secure anchor and based on our eternal salvation. Jesus the Bible says in verse 20, is our forerunner. That doesn't mean he's a Toyota, all right? Jesus is our forerunner. A forerunner uh, often referred to in the ancient world, referred to a small boat sent into the harbor by a larger ship that was unable to enter that harbor. But it needed to be anchored there. And so they would send the small boat ahead with the anchor in the boat. Take the anchor inside the, the breakwater and drop the anchor in, in the harbor there. That's what forerunner was used in one sense. Another sense of the word, same word, forerunner, was also used in the ancient world to designate a scout who would run ahead of the main uh, group, whether it's an army or a, or a, a, a caravan, a, a merchant caravan. This scout would run ahead of the main group and arrive at the destination before all of the others, and he would secure the safety of that destination. And, and his arrival, the forerunner's arrival, meant that the others were soon to follow. If he came there and he secured it, the others would soon get there and they would get there safely. Well, Jesus is our forerunner. He arose from the dead and entered within into the veil. That is, he entered into the very presence of the Father in heaven. He's our high priest who sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He is our forerunner. His entrance there means that someday we are going there because he has secured the place for us. He brought our anchor into God's presence and dropped it in firm soil. In heaven, Jesus is our high priest. And that means 
He secures the forgiveness of all our sins. But how long does He do that? It says He is high priest. How long? Forever. After the order of Melchizedek. This, what, so what is hope in Christ? Say all that to say this. What is hope in Christ? Hope in Christ is the assurance that we have of our eternal salvation. Assurance that we can never lose it because it is secured by Jesus in the presence of God the Father. That's our security. The assurance is based on our security in Him. You know there's a difference between security and assurance, right? Security is the fact that Christ holds us in His hand. The Father holds us in His hands and nobody can pluck us out of the Father's hands. He cannot lose salvation. That's security. Assurance is when you believe it. Assurance is when you appropriate that fact into your life and live as someone assured of the Father's ability to hold on to His end of the anchor and to hold on and make sure that your salvation is never going to slip away. That's what hope is. That's what Christian hope is. It is assurance in salvation. What does Christian hope do then? If that's what it is, what does it do? Well, this hope brings strong consolation into your life. Look at verse 18. That by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. The ones who are holding on to this hope have, here and now, strong consolation. Consolation, this word means comfort and encouragement. It means to come alongside and give aid in the most needful time. The same word is translated comfort in Romans 15 and verse 4. Listen to this. It says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So that same comfort, uh, that same word, translated strong consolation here in Hebrews is translated comfort and it refers to the scripture our our reading and our trusting in the word of God brings us strong consolation our hope in eternal salvation our assurance brings us strong consolation in this life that's what Christian hope does it comes to you in your greatest crisis your severest storm and it says this is not the end of everything Christ is your refuge he is your hope yes you messed up but it's not the end yes you are having a crisis of doubt but it is it is God that is holding on to you yes you are going through a great difficulty something that nags you something that is really really hard but Christ is with you in that storm, anchoring you. That is what hope does. Hope, Christian hope in the midst of a storm tells you that the storm is temporary and that God will see you through. The Christian life is not just waiting until we get to heaven to find comfort from our pain and from our anxieties and from our failures and from our sin. Christian hope is for this life and it fills this life with hope now. That's what it does. It comforts us. It encourages us in the exact moment that we need it. The Apostle Paul understood the comfort of hope and, and the consolation of hope when he wrote in 2 Corinthians 4.17 and said, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, hoping in eternity with Christ and glory brought such comfort uh, in the present life to Paul that he said it was a light affliction. But think about him. He was stoned and left for dead. He was persecuted. He was chased out of every city he went to. Yes, he preached the gospel. He won lots of people to Christ, but most of the people he preached to hated him. And then he spent many years in prison only to have his head chopped off. And he said, this affliction is light. How? His soul was anchored through that whole storm with Christian hope. Hope in Christ. What does hope do? 
It brings a strong consolation here and now in the midst of our storms and trials. And that consolation keeps us from drifting to despair, to ruin, into sin, into unfaithfulness. That consolation keeps us from drifting. Who can have hope in Christ then? We've seen what it is, what it does. Who can have it? Only a person who takes hold of Christ can have that hope in him. One day I was fishing with a friend on, on his little boat. We had one of those anchors that was, you know, it should, it, it, it looks like it will never work and it never does. You know, that little bell-shaped anchor. <clears throat> and we're fishing and he says, throw the anchor overboard. I throw the anchor overboard. And there it goes. And there goes the rope out with it. And then there goes the end of the rope. <laughs> I don't know how deep it was. Never saw that anchor again. And we were adrift. That anchor didn't do us much good, did it? <laughs> he didn't tell me it wasn't tied onto the boat. I don't know if he knew either. Um, that, why did that anchor do, do us no good? Well, no one was holding on to it on our end, right? It was probably, it might have been secure down there, <laughs> but it was just down there. It was not up with us. Uh, I want you to notice the exclusive language of this passage with me. Look at verse 18, the second part of the verse. It says that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. The word refuge there is used in the Septuagint. That is the Greek translation of the Old Testament that, that Jesus and the apostles would have read in, in their time. And the Septuagint uses the same term refuge to refu to refer to the cities of refuge in the old testament there was a law that if you were if you had committed unintentional if you had unintentionally killed somebody you could flee to the city of refuge and be safe from the person who would avenge you of that death as long as you stayed in that city of refuge it's a picture of christ and and uh, here he's using that kind of language he says we fled to christ for our refuge from sin and our refuge from our blood guiltiness to lay hold, to grasp the, whole, the hope set before us. The strong consolation is promised. Who can have it? Only to the ones who have fled to Christ for refuge and have laid hold upon that hope. In verse 17, it says, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto who? The heirs of promise. Those who have grasped the promise of God, who have received Christ. A Christian can have security, but not assurance sometimes. They're secure because Christ will never let him go, but there's no assurance because he doesn't cling to the hope of that security. Yes, when he dies, he will go to heaven. But security is in Christ, but assurance is in us. And so, and so not clinging to that hope, not clinging to that assurance, he drifts. Oh, what is the use? I sin. He drifts and never grows into maturity in Christ. Only, as a, only a believer in Christ has any right to that consolation of, insurance, of assurance anyway. Um, only, only a believer is anchored hope in christ anchors your soul it's it's in every storm of life there is no storm so big that it overwhelms this hope there is no wave so small that it is too insignificant for hope to overcome strong confidence is a, in a sure thing that hope anchors your soul now is this true can you trust that or is this just wishful thinking? Is this just dry theology? Is this something we just, yeah, maybe this sounds good in a classroom or in Sunday school, but what about at work on Thursday afternoon? What about Saturday when, when temptation hits? Is this true? Can you trust it? Can you count on the anchor of your soul to keep you from drifting? Let me offer you some good arguments as to why this is true. You can trust it. You can count on it. Take, for instance, I'm going to give you just two testimonies. First of all, the testimony of the one who made the anchor can 
tell you <laughs> that you can count on it. All right, there's a testimony of the one who made the anchor. You can trust to hope because of the proven character of God who created this hope. God made this anchor. He designed it perfectly. So let's consider the testimony of God in this matter. By the way, I, I, I love seeing... And I often see a tag on items of merchandise that say handcrafted. Sometimes they'll say handmade in the USA, right? Why do they put that on there? Well, they put that on there. The marketers put, put the, those tags on products because they know that if you trust the character of the manufacturer, you will believe in the quality of the product, right? Well, when God himself created the anchor of our hope, because of that, you can certainly trust that it will anchor your soul. It's a guarantee. In verse 13, the Bible says, For when God made promise to, to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. Hope in Christ is, gr in, is grounded in the promise of of God. God promised Abraham that he, would, that he would multiply him and bless him. God wanted to demonstrate that his promise was unchangeable and so he swore an oath in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 21. What is the purpose of an oath? Well, an oath is supposed to put an end to the argument. Look at verse uh, 16. For men swear, verily swear by the greater an oath of confirmation is to them what an end of all strife is supposed to end the argument that's the purpose how does an oath put an end to the argument well the one who swears an oath invokes some power or honor higher than himself and and in this swearing his truth upon that person or thing is supposed to guarantee that he'll keep his word and this is a problem for God because there is nothing higher for God to swear upon to, to invoke in an oath. And so in verse 16, for men verily swear by the greater, an oath of confirmation is to them the end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show or to demonstrate unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. God is saying, I wanted to demonstrate to Abraham and I want to demonstrate to you that, that my purpose, my salvation, it doesn't change. My calling is without repentance. He says, and so how does he, how does he swear an oath if there's nothing higher? In verse 18, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. And so back in verse 13 and 14, God invoked himself. He swore by his own character that he would fulfill his promise to Abraham. In the same way, God's own character is on the line when it comes to the hope that he promises you in Christ. If you come to God by faith in Christ and He rejects you, He makes Himself a liar and He can't do that. It's impossible for God to lie in this matter or in any, in any matter. He will not do that. Uh, you can trust to hope in Christ because of God's character. He can't lie. And you can have complete assurance of salvation in Him. John 6, 37, Jesus said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Knowing this, we have an anchor for our souls in all of the storms of life. The, the, the good argument for it is this, the character of the one who created the, the argument. That's a good testimony in favor of it. Let me tell you one other reason to anchor your soul by hope in Christ. Is it true? Yes, it is. Let me give you the testimony. Consider the testimony of one who has used the anchor. There's an example here. There's one on the witness stand, and it is Abraham. And Abraham testifies and says, you can trust a hope in Christ. The anchor of the soul has been proven true in the past. We have success story to, that's given to us. Abraham offers his testimony and says, it's true. You can count on, on the Lord. It has worked for me. Consider the testimony of the one who used the anchor. Verse 13, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely in blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And look at, here he is clinging to the anchor. Verse 15, And so, after he had patiently endured, he 
obtained the promise. Now, Abraham had plenty of storms in life. But by believing God, by hoping in him, Abraham remained anchored in all the storms of life. He did not drift into unfaithfulness to the Lord. Lot did. He encountered a storm of a good opportunity, pleasure, financial windfall. And Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. Not Abraham. Abraham was anchored in his soul. The storms could not be his ruin. By the way, Abraham was not perfect. He was far from perfect. In fact, he had been promised an heir and it was just not working. And Sarah, his wife, came and said, Abraham, take my handmaid and see what happens here. And Ishmael was born. That was the son of the flesh, not the son of promise. And so he did fail. And, 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 and this is the thing about having our souls anchored in hope is that when we do fail, when we do sin, we don't lose Christ. We don't lose God's favor. We don't lose God's love. We remain secure in him. And Abraham remained and he believed God. God promised, and listen to this promise. God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a child by Sarah. And by the way, when he made this promise, Abraham was 75 and she was 65. But if that's not far-fetched enough, they went another 25 years. Abraham was 100, she was 90. That would be interesting. You talk about a trial of faith, but Abraham believed God. It was counted to him for righteousness and God delivered. It says he patiently endured. A 75-year-old man waiting for a baby. And he waited 25 more years. Ouch. All right? Take it from Abraham. Isaac was born. And then God says, when Isaac's about a teenager, I know I've given you this one child, and now you're like 115 or 120. Can you please just take him up on this mountain and stab him to death? What did Abraham do? He took him up on the mountain. He didn't stab him to death. But he was going to. God didn't allow that because God doesn't approve of such things. But he wanted to see if Abraham would withhold his only son in faith. Abraham anchored by hope. What happened? He obtained the promise. What do you mean? Today, there are millions of Jewish people. But even today, there are even more millions of believers who all in Christ are the heirs of faithful Abraham. We are the heirs of promise. What promise? The promise given to Abraham. Take it from Abraham. Hope in Christ anchors our souls. It's secure. You can count on it. Priscilla Owens understood this, and so she wrote, We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure, while the billows roll, fastened to the rock which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. In the catacombs of Rome, where in times of great persecution, the Christians would actually hide. These were graves. And they would go underground in these catacombs of Rome and they would hide from certain death, from persecution, from physical harm. In, in those catacombs, there's one symbol that can be seen more than any other symbol. You know what that is? It's not a fish. It's an anchor. Even in the ancient pagan world, the anchor was considered a symbol of hope. And it was for Christians huddling in darkened tombs for their very lives. They painted, they scratched anchors into the walls. Why? Because they understood this. That they had an anchor to their soul. And so the anchor was an ancient Christian symbol for safety, security, and hope. Hope in Christ anchors your soul in every storm. Have you made Christ your anchor of hope? See, Jesus will not be your anchor until He is your Savior. You must have your sins forgiven. For when we are yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. And Christ is your anchor in storms. Are you currently anchoring your soul on the hope that you have in Christ.